Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between Harry and Andrea, two students who have just finished their final exams. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Hi, Andrea. How are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too, but I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are, and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything: furniture, the fridge, and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away, but I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance, and the clothes just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway, I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the student union building. And in the economics department, anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. Okay, what what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors, and price you want, your name of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer, so they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try. Might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the trading post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week, advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in, and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible, and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the trading post, but I should have a look at it. And I could advertise the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture, but the kitchen stuff isn't really that good. You know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans, and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop. You know, like the Salvation Army or Saint Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me, and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff, the furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post, and you can help me write the advert. Well, actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave. Depending on the price, of course. Okay, let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part two. You will hear a phone conversation giving information about a health and fitness centre. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now, listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Hello. Hello. Is that Miss Heidi Jones? Yes. Good morning, Miss Jones. I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to tell you about the Seven Oaks Health and Fitness Centre, which is in your suburb. Would that be convenient? Okay. Well, the centre's not far from you. It's on the corner of Marion Street and Giles Street, and has a large car park. It's open every day of the week, opening on weekdays at 6 a.m. and at 9 a.m. at the weekend. It closes at 9:30 p.m. Monday to Friday, and on Saturday at 4 p.m. and Sunday at 2 p.m. We also have childcare Monday to Saturday from 9 in the morning until midday for a small extra charge. So you can leave your children in safe hands while you attend one of our classes, or perhaps have a swim, or if you just want to relax in the spa and sauna or steam room. Talking of classes, we have a very wide range which are designed to suit all different levels of fitness and individual needs. I mentioned the pool just now. Well, in addition to swimming laps or just relaxing, we also offer aqua aerobic classes, which are 45-minute classes that use the therapeutic effects of water. This provides a very safe and effective exercise, and is suitable for all fitness levels, as well as being a lot of fun. Many people who haven't been exercising for a while start in the aqua classes, as do people who need to take care after hospital surgery, for example. These classes are very popular and are scheduled every weekday, Monday to Friday, and on Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. Another very popular activity in the pool area is learning to swim, and these swimming classes are held at 4 p.m. every weekday and in the mornings at the weekend. By the way, they're open to both adults and children of any age. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now, it would take too much of your time to tell you in detail about all our programs, as we have a very wide range of activities at different times. However, I'll just outline some of them. Our super circuit classes are extremely popular, and you get a good aerobic workout while toning your muscles. They're easy to learn as you combine using hydraulic equipment with exercises guaranteed to give you a good cardio workout. The teachers are very good, and there's a fun atmosphere. And the classes are very effective in assisting weight loss, relieving stress, lowering blood pressure, and generally increasing fitness. Oh, and I haven't mentioned our range of aerobic and step classes of different types, which suit all levels. Our specially designed aerobics room holds over 55 people. And our highly qualified and trained staff can advise you as to which class might suit you. We are inviting you to a free one-week trial period when you can come and try any of the classes or activities before you make the decision to join. By the way, there is also a large and very well-equipped gym, where we offer free fitness assessments, and you can have an individual program designed just for you. Also, the cardiovascular room has the latest range of machines, which help you burn fat, increase your fitness, or just warm up. They are very popular, as you can forget all about the calorie burning by watching your favourite music videos on TV while you exercise. Right now, we have a very special new member joining fee offer, which allows two memberships for the price of one—a real bargain. So, if you can, bring along a friend who'd like to get fit as well in time for summer. Come along and try us out. You can meet the staff. Try out some of the classes for a week, absolutely free, 
And then, if you like us, sign up for only one hundred and ten dollars each for six months. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the centre, and I hope we'll see you there soon, Heidi. I'll put one of our brochures in the mail for you right now. Bye for now. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You're going to hear a conversation between Dick and Sue, who are two college students. They are talking about the history of flight. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, Sue. Wow, this is great. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. I'm really looking forward to doing this project on the Wright Brothers. Me too. My dad was an Air Force pilot, always talking about the Wright Brothers. If they hadn't invented the airplane, my dad might not have had a job. OK, let's look at the questionnaire. Where shall we start? The stuff on the Wright Brothers starts over there. OK, first questions. First names, Wilbur and Orville. Everyone knows that. Then when and where they were born... Oh, and died. Let's see. Wilbur, the third son, was born on a farm in Indiana on April the 16th, 1867, and died of typhus in 1912. Pretty young, eh? Oh, and in 1965, he was selected for the Hall of Fame for Great Americans. Make a note of that. OK. And what about Orville? Here we are, born in Dayton, Ohio, in 1871. Died 1948. Doesn't say why or where. We'll find out later. What's next? What got them interested in flying? As the conversation continues, please answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. It says here that their dad used to buy them lots of toys, and one was like a helicopter. And it seems that this toy helicopter first got them interested in the idea. Also, they read about this German guy who made himself a pair of large wings and managed to glide. Then they started to read everything they could get their hands on about flying and began building a plane in 1900. Next. Their first jobs? Um, they started a printing shop and also a bicycle shop. I guess they both needed some knowledge of mechanics. It helps if you want to make the world's first airplane. I suppose so. Anything else? Yeah. OK, and now the big question. When did they first fly their airplane? Well, they made a glider and flew it in 1902. But the one that made them famous was, I'll read it to you, the first ever heavier-than-air manned-powered flight in 1903. Got the exact date there? No, just the year. We can easily find it later. Hey, but listen to this. Government bureaucrats thought they were crazy, and some engineers thought that if two bicycle mechanics could build a successful airplane, they could do it too. Hey, you write down the answers now. Let me have a read. Here's the day they first tried to fly it. Monday, December the 14th, 1903. They tossed a coin and decided that Wilbur would take the first turn as pilot. And the plane weighed 600 pounds. He started off but turned the rudder too sharply and the left wing hit the hillside. So they repaired it, and Orville tried again on Thursday, December the 17th, 1903. So that was the big day. Yeah. The flight wasn't much. 12 seconds, 120 feet. I'll read what it says. But it was the first controlled, sustained flight in a heavier-than-aircraft, one of the great moments of the century. And on their third flight that day, Wilbur flew 852 feet 
in 59 seconds. OK, time for a coffee. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You're going to hear a talk about ecological functions of forests. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to say how happy I am to have this opportunity to address this committee and hopefully contribute to our country's policy in respect to the importation and use of wood and wood products. I will start with a brief introduction to the current situation of the world's forests and then give you an overview of the various services that forests provide. By services, I mean benefits to people as well as wildlife. Until recent years, these services have been greatly undervalued. The rate of deforestation worldwide is astounding. The Rainforest Action Network estimated in 1999 that 2.4 acres, that's one hectare, about the size of two football fields, was being lost, not every day or every hour, but every second. An area larger than New York City every day, or 31 million hectares a year, an area larger than Poland. Despite the efforts of environmental groups and concerned people all over the world, the rate of deforestation has increased in recent years. The results of global deforestation are far-reaching. It means the loss of habitat for numerous species of plants and animals. It is a major factor in the warnings from scientists worldwide that, if mankind does not change how we treat our planet, 50% of species could be extinct by the middle of this century. I am sure you all know what this loss of biodiversity would mean for us humans. The loss of genetic resources would seriously threaten our food security. For example, to maintain resistance to pests and diseases, our major cereal crops, rice, corn, and wheat, need to have genes introduced from wild relatives every few years. And who knows what new medicines we would be losing, especially with the destruction of tropical forests, which, like coral reefs and wetlands, are especially rich in biodiversity. And then there's global warming, a problem that threatens the very existence of civilization, but one which, with the exception of some northern European countries, is not treated with the urgency it deserves. Forests are important carbon sinks, taking in atmospheric carbon dioxide and storing it in their wood and the soil. Moreover, they are mostly destroyed by logging and fire. Burning releases carbon dioxide and decaying vegetation releases methane into the atmosphere. These are both major greenhouse gases. It is estimated that one-third of the increasing levels of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere come from deforestation. In addition, healthy forests and the soil under them that they protect store water when it rains, and slowly release it during dry seasons. Take away the trees and you have floods in the rainy season and drought in the dry season. We have seen more and more of this in recent years in Haiti, Indonesia, China. Look at this year's devastating floods in Bangladesh due to rapid deforestation in the Himalayas and many other countries. I have mentioned protecting the soil. Most of the landslides that killed hundreds of people and destroyed thousands of houses during the hurricane that hit Haiti this year would probably not have happened if virtually all of Haiti's forests had not been cut down for fuel. Another important ecological function of forests is their role in the hydrological cycle. Rainfalls. Some of the water moves through the soil to feed streams and rivers. The rest evaporates into the air, providing moisture for clouds and rain hundreds of kilometers downwind. Break this cycle and the people downwind have less rain for agriculture and other uses, and the people downstream face a greater risk of floods. 
This effect is now seen very clearly in the Amazon, Central Africa, and elsewhere. And we must not forget coral. Coral reefs are essential habitat for countless thousands of fish and other marine species. Over 50% of these important parts, important economically, not just beautiful things to look at, of the marine ecosystem are now damaged. The main reasons are warmer seawater, chemical pollution, and dynamite fishing, but eroded soil from deforested land that runs into the sea is another. Corals need clean water to survive. Without this, they die. So does the marine life that depends on them, and the fishermen end up with no fish and no income. And we must not forget the many millions of people who depend on healthy forests for their living. Many of these people, tribes in the Amazon, for example, have lived in harmony with the forests for thousands of years. When their jungle home is destroyed, they all too often end up as marginal people in the slums of big cities. And for us rich people, the forest environment provides us with wonderful opportunities for ecotourism, hiking, camping, bird watching, and other outdoor activities. Before we stop for coffee, I would say just one more thing. Many studies by environmental economists show that the free ecological services provided by a tree in an intact forest, reliable water supply, climate moderation, etc., are worth 20 to several hundred times as much as the wood when it is cut down for timber. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. There are a few things you can do to get ideas for IELTS writing. Read widely on a variety of topics. This will expose you to different ideas and perspectives, which can be helpful when brainstorming for essay topics and supporting arguments. Pay attention to current events. IELTS essays often cover current issues so it's important to be aware of what's happening in the world. Read news articles, watch news broadcasts, and listen to podcasts to stay informed. Keep a journal or notebook where you can jot down ideas for essays. This could be anything from a brief phrase to a fully developed essay plan. Discuss potential essay topics with friends, family, and classmates. This can help you to explore different ideas and get feedback on your thoughts. Use online resources such as IELTS websites and blogs to find essay topics and ideas. Here are some specific ideas for IELTS writing. Education. What are the benefits and drawbacks of online learning? Should schools focus on academic subjects or also on teaching life skills? How can we improve the quality of education for all students? What are the challenges and opportunities of educating students in a multicultural society? What role should technology play in the classroom? Technology. How has technology changed the way we live and work? What are the benefits and risks of social media? How can we protect children from the dangers of the online?